おはようございます。2019年のような素晴らしい人手で嬉しく見ているのは。
a, uh, a study group with, uh, that met uh, 19 times with uh, knowledgeable persons, and we uh, created a, a proposal. I believe it's been handed out. It's rather long, so I will be giving you a, um, a summary of it. So in 2013, the present NSS was created, but since then, the security environment around Japan has uh, become more severe in an accelerated fashion, especially uh, China, North Korea, Russia have uh, increased their military uh, strength, and they have uh, become very uh, active in military activity, and uh, therefore we must be prepared for complex compound situations. Now, with respect to these changes, first of all, uh, we have, uh, I will report to you about how we have changed our assessment of our environment. China was referred to as a country of strong concern, but now uh, our proposal is that it should be seen as a serious threat. North Korea was a serious imminent threat now because they have missiles that are uh, like ICBMs. Uh, it's uh, being described as a more serious imminent threat. Russia was monitor trends, but if you look at Ukraine, we can say that it is an actual threat. Thus, we raised our assessment of the severity of our situation. Next, about uh, defense spending. Uh, the NATO countries have a, a goal of 2% of GDP for uh, defense spending. With this in mind, within five years, we would like to um, achieve the necessary level of um, budgetary funding in order to fundamentally strengthen. Now, we are uh, free uh, countries, NATO, the U.S., we must increase our defense, and we must uh, maintain our security posture. Japan uh, needs to make a commitment uh, as well. So these figures come out of that uh, kind of discussion. What's important is changes in the way that we fight. Fast technological innovation. Uh, is bringing about uh, fundamental changes in uh, the ways that people fight space, cyber, the EW domain, information uh, warfare, uh, cross-domain operational capabilities, uh, the ability to fight uh, with endurance and resilience um, are uh, all indispensable in order to, uh, in terms of improving our capabilities. Now, uh, with respect to hybrid uh, uh, fights, we must uh, be prepared for them in the cyber area with, with, uh, uh, with a whole of, of government approach in order to um, be prepared for information warfare. Now, fact checks must be done. A, 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 uh, in order to uh, compete, uh, in order to counter information uh, warfare. And we have to have to uh, be involved in active cyber defense that would take active defense measures against uh, uh, cyber attacks and not simply passive, uh, passively uh, uh, receiving uh, damages. Uh, it's necessary for uh, urgent uh, study to be done in this area, including improving our uh, legislation and uh, clarifying the uh, situation of uh, relationships with uh, current uh, legislation. It's also uh, important uh, for us to uh, improve our uh, space situational uh, awareness uh, and our uh, resilience in, in space. Uh, we also have to be, have uh, 
counter-strike capabilities against uh, countries that might attack us, including with domestic uh, ballistic uh, uh, missiles. And uh, we must be able to uh, deter such strikes. This is something that uh, is being proposed to the government. With respect to the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, we must uh, uh, strengthen our cooperation with like-minded countries, with the Quad, ASEAN, the EU, uh, European countries, NATO, AUKUS. We should cooperate uh, with uh, these in order to build up structures in which like-minded countries can cooperate. Also, uh, like Russia, uh, we must, uh, has done, it is uh, intolerable that uh, countries would threaten other countries with uh, hinting at the use of nuclear weapons. We must uh, improve our, the credibility of extended deterrence in order to do this, uh, thorough discussions between the U.S. and uh, Japan uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, politicians should be uh, carried out. We intend to increase our R&D spending on research with uh, the relevant ministries and to boldly make use of the private sector and universities. It's uh, necessary to incorporate civilian, uh, civil technology into uh, defense. So this is my summary. This is what we've learned from the Ukraine war. We must increase our defensive capability, and we also uh, must uh, reinforce our ties with allies. This is the way to preserve the peace. We will uh, go about improving our defensive capability in cooperation with the United States. Thank you. Um. That was great, and the document is impressive, and you can find it in Japanese or English online. And I think it is important that the commission under Onodera-san put out this um, proposal because it will invite public discussion and debate um, as part of the process uh, in Japan, which is necessary in a democracy. And having worked on a number of strategic documents at the White House and the Pentagon myself, um, I, I have to say I'm impressed with the content and also impressed how well the Abe government's 2013 national security strategy held up. Mm -hmm. It really conceptually uh, and operationally is a very strong uh, basis for Japan's security. But as you know, the security situation has deteriorated and the challenges have multiplied. One of the things that will be of greatest interest in the U.S. is the, is the focus on strike capability. Um, and um, it's a capability I think most American experts would say is necessary for Japan, but conceptually and operationally, it's a, it's a very new um, thing for the alliance. And um, I wanted to ask Sato-san about strike. I think we're all trying to understand the conceptual framework. Is this uh, a strike capability for deterrence by uh, denial, you know, striking, uh, operational nodes, or is it deterrence by punishment, holding at risk um, valuable targets to deter, um, and is it a capability that would be integrated bilaterally? We don't have a joint and combined command, so how would we do that? There are a lot of, um, a lot of questions about strike. I haven't heard very much criticism at all in Washington uh, or in the region um, about the capability, but there are a lot of big questions. So Sato-san, can you help us understand what the current thinking is? Thank you very much, Dr. Green. It's also the first time for me to be in Washington uh, in two and a half years. I've really been looking forward. And I'll be on uh, Fuji television Sunday uh, morning program as soon as I get back. And uh, I see one of the, um, the persons responsible for that show here in the audience. So I'm sure that the, that will lead to a, a great. Now, counter strike capability, it's not a single issue. 
first of all, please issue, understand that it's uh, multifaceted uh, and it's not uh, deterrence, but it's not punitive deterrence. It is uh, a deterrence that is uh, denial. Now, we will improve our defensive capabilities, but also our counter strike. We will have counter strike capabilities. Missile defense, uh, missile. Uh, uh, technology is going so fast that it's uh, becoming impossible to uh, a deal with them uh, conventionally. Now, we are not saying that Japan itself will have all of the strike ability. It will be part of the U.S.-Japan. It's not realistic to say that Japan would have all the strike coverage. We have to understand the targets. We also have to evaluate the uh, fires. And so we need uh, satellites, and we have to have uh, cyber and uh, EW capabilities in order to neutralize the uh, other side's capabilities. And we can't do this just with Japan, and uh, we will have we will need time to do this, and we'll be within the uh, uh, framework of the U.S.-Japan alliance. It's a realistic plan. However, U.S. assets will also be able to be used for other purposes. So this is not strike capability, but counter-strike capability. And that is because we wanted to make it clear politically that we will not be engaging in first strikes, which are uh, prohibited in international law. So cyber intelligence, human, the uh, movements of uh, enemy troops are imminent. If that is the judgment, then even if it's before such an attack, we are saying that such a counterstrike would be possible. Cyber intelligence capability must be improved in Japan, but we would also like for cooperation from the U.S. and the other five eyes. Another uh, question is what kind of uh, standoff missile would have? F-15s or F-35s, joint strike missiles, or the uh, SSM-12, uh, uh, SSM to be developed in the future are uh, subsonic and they have a high probability of being intercepted because of their simple trajectory. In the future, it will be necessary to develop hypersonic missiles and missiles with high survivability, such as those that rotate in the terminal path and difficult to intercept. And AI-powered uh, autonomous missiles have characteristics that make it easier to avoid misfires. China has about uh, 1,900 ground-launched intermediate range and shorter range ballistic missiles with a range that can hit Japan to counter this, in addition to air-launched sea and underwater-launched standoff missiles. I believe that placing some ground-launched standoff missiles in Hokkaido would be extremely effective in deterring China, Russia, and North Korea. The geopolitical advantage of the area is that it's more than 2,500 kilometers from Hokkaido to the Nansei Islands. In addition, Hokkaido's resident sentiment is relatively favorable toward the self-defense forces and the U.S. forces, as well as their growing concern about Russia. The standoff missiles to be placed in Hokkaido would normally be deployed in Hokkaido's training grounds for the defense of the Nansei Islands, including the Senkaku Islands, and would be mobile missiles that can fly 2,500 kilometers and be launched beyond the atmosphere. If mobile, they can be moved to western Japan if necessary. Furthermore, I wonder if it would be possible to use the joint Japan-U.S. training grounds in Hokkaido to fire the hypersonic missiles being developed by the U.S. Army and to link this to the deployment of a provisional U.S. Army missile unit. In any case, I personally think that if U.S. medium-range missiles were to be deployed in Japan, if at all, it would be difficult to place them anywhere but Hokkaido. I believe that placing J Japanese and U.S. medium-range missiles in Hokkaido could be a step toward building a counterattack capability through Japan-U.S. cooperation on land. Thank you. Oh. 
I think that people in, the, in Japan can understand this, but for people abroad, you may be wondering why it's taken us this long to talk about counter-strike capability. After the war, because of our constitution, we have always uh, made the decision that we would not make uh, attacks in the other country's territory. So with old equipment, there would be, say, um, firing from a ship or a bomber, and w we could counter-strike that without going to the other country's territory, and that was fine. But now we have ballistic missiles from, for example, North Korea, which has tested them several times. And the possibility uh, that Japan could be hit by a ballistic missile exists. And in order to counter-strike that, you will have to hit the other country's territory. Otherwise, you can't protect Japan. That's why counter-strike capability is becoming such a, a buzzword for us. And what kind of equipment will we have? Where will we deploy it? How will the U.S. and Japan uh, coordinate? We had uh, a, a wonderful personal view uh, expressed by uh, Sato Sensei just now. But the government has to take the responsibility and engage in careful consultations with local governments to uh, choose the best spot. I think that's the message. Uh, operationally and politically. Uh, so thank you to both of you. And I think it's pretty clear when you look at Ukraine's defense right now mm -hmm. that the legal and ethical and moral um, context for counter-strike capability in self-defense is obvious. But the other thing that's becoming clear in the Ukraine case, and you may have seen it in the Wall Street Journal today, we cannot produce enough missiles fast yeah. enough for the demand around the world. The Wall Street Journal reported that Taiwan, which has a very important need for artillery and missiles for its own defense right now, is finding delays in delivery. Um, industry leaders in the U.S. said there are inventory problems. Um, Australia is committing to ramp up production of missiles in its sovereign missile program. So there's a huge supply and demand problem that is um, not just for Japan. And of course, on the U.S. side, the Marine Corps and the Army uh, have new concepts of operation which rely much more on um, tactical uh, missiles of different kinds. So there's a defense industrial problem mm -hmm. that we all have to solve. And when I say we all, in my view, it's not just US, Japan, I think Australia, right. Britain, and others um, have, to be, have to be part of this solution because we can clearly see the demand will increase for legitimate counter-strike capability for self-defense. It will also cost a lot. So Sheila, the proposal <laughs> from the um, LDP calls for um, reaching a 2% of GDP defense spending. Um, uh, it's now in the LDP party platform, but as I read the document, the proposal was over five years. Mm -hmm. um, now, one way you could do that is just to shrink the GDP until you get to 2%, but a better <laughs> way <laughs> is to grow the GDP and grow defense capabilities. But how realistic or politically you know, uh, do you think this is or is it too slow, five mm. years? Mm. That's a great question. I, I just wanted to say that you know, by the time the new national security strategy and national defense strategy are adopted in Japan, you will have a decade uh, from that original um, national security strategy that you noted by the Abe cabinet. And it, it's just been amazing to watch the region, watch the military balance shift with increasing speed, but also the way in which the United States and Japan have attempted to respond to that, including uh, this strategic review by Japan, I think has also been very, very important. Um, you know, the two issues, of course, that are politically sensitive is, you know, Representative Sato's discussion on counter-strike, um, or 
I guess, counter-strike capabilities, plural. Um, and I'm delighted to hear that will be in the alliance framework and in consultation with us. Um, but I think the defense is also the, how much Japan is willing to spend on defense is also the second issue that will get an awful lot of attention as the government moves forward. I read the report with great interest. I actually had read the media before uh, Representative Onodera came here to Washington, that he had adamantly said, we need a time frame within which we are going to achieve this goal of 2%, uh, which is again modeled on our NATO allies. Um, so he succeeded in persuading his party that a five-year goal was what they should be thinking about. And, you know, if you don't worry about growth or no growth, even if you keep the numbers steady, you're looking at a, a, a doubling of Japan's defense spending from what's roughly $52 billion a year, forget the yen rate calculation at the moment, um, but to $104 billion, right? I mean, over five years, that's a tremendous uptick and uh, upgrade for Japanese uh, for the Japanese Ministry of Defense. I think, you know, it's it's without significant economic growth, those funds will have to come from elsewhere. So like any democracy, you're going to have a little bit of a struggle in, inside Japan over where the priorities of the Japanese defense budget ought to be on social security, on debt servicing, on other kinds of issues. Um, but the ten, about $10 billion a year will have to be added to the defense budget to meet that goal. So that's a, it's a very ambitious goal. Um, I, I think you know I, I will be watching to see um, if this goes from being the LDP's policy ambition to the national policy ambition and the place I would expect to see that would be both in the national security strategy but also in the national defense strategy that it will be codified and the annual budgets will be built in over five years now this is the proposal that's in uh, in this document that the LDP has put forward that there will be no more annual negotiations over budget but rather there will be a five-year budget that basically solidifies this goal so we were watching a lot of not only changes in the ambitions and the goals of the Japanese uh, military planning but also in the process as well this would be a very big shift in the way that Japan invests in its military uh, and that it decides on how it wants to, to, to respond to the region. The only other thing I'd say here, and there's many experts here in the room that hopefully will contribute to this part of the conversation, but that is what do you want to spend the money on? And the report is very detailed, the LDP report is very comprehensive and very thoughtful. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, with budgets on what kind of procurements, what kind of sustainability and resilience measures will Japan need to take? And here there are experts in the room on that as well. But also, how do the United States and Japan come together to think about their military investments? Who is going to do what? And who is going to invest in what is going to be very, very important for us as an alliance to, to think through together not your budget making process or commitment, but rather where do we get the best roles, missions and capabilities balancing act uh, as we go forward. So I think that's the other piece of it. We are gonna have to think as allies how we best spend our money yeah. for, for a collective uh, uh, deterrent capability. Mm -hmm. And I know the report emphasizes sustainment, ammunition, munitions, um, right. not just the platforms, right. but actually a realistic assessment of what's yeah. needed to sustain a, a fight. And that's very important. Do you think the German 2% commitment is going to be a decisive factor in the political debate? So I watch, and again, all of these things that we're talking about, I think, have been deeply influenced by what's happening in Europe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, as you pointed out, Mike, has not only revealed a lot about the Russian military and its setbacks, but also about what it takes for the Ukrainians to defend their country. And I think we've got lots of lessons to be learned here. But, but certainly, I think the German chancellor coming out and committing the way he did it will, we'll have to see in implementation whether Germany will actually be able to do what he promised it would do. But I do think that the Japanese people looked at the German example, and I'm sure our representatives here also considered that as they were thinking about a timeline. I think it helped support the Japanese desire to move into more uh, higher Japanese uh, military spending. One of the core security issues the US and Japan address consistently is the security of the Taiwan Strait right. and the Ukraine uh, invasion and China's growing coercion and military capability have really sharpened the focus in both the US and Japan on Taiwan. And um, recently, you may have seen that Nikkei Shimbun had a survey that showed 74% of the Japanese public said Japan should play a role, yeah. which was quite striking. 
And then um, uh, in Taiwan, there was a survey uh, about a week or two ago that showed that the, ja the Taiwanese public thinks that Japan will defend Taiwan more than the U.S. will. Which, um, which I took as a personal failure because the, <laughs> the administration, the White say? House, sent me and Mike <laughs> Mullen and a group of former officials to reassure Taiwan <laughs> that we would support Taiwan even more because of this Ukraine invasion, but the public opinion polls show we have more work to do in the U.S. Uh, to reassure Taiwan. Um, Sato-san, I'll start with you, but I want to hear from Onodera-san and Sheila. But Sato-san, how, how do you see the debate in Japan? It looks like the political and, and, and uh, sort of media coverage is, is, is ready, but maybe the government is not <laughs> for a greater role on Taiwan. So, uh, let me talk about defense spending. German has said that 2% or above. Um, and it's a political will to create a, a funding like that. Now, the government of Japan should uh, express its will. So, Suga Biden talked. Uh, in their uh, joint declaration about uh, peace and stability. And Japan has to play its role in bringing that about. In the G7 summit declaration, we uh, were able to persuade uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel to include the Taiwan Strait. Next year, Japan will chair the G7. And when we talk about the Taiwan Strait, Japan's uh, GDP, uh, uh, defense spending per GDP, if it's only 1%, that will be too low. So now the uh, foreign ministry is uh, also uh, in agreement with increasing. I think a contingency on Taiwan should be viewed as a Japanese contingency. From China's perspective, the Senkaku Islands, which are Japanese territory, are part of Taiwan province, and Taiwan shares a border of about 110 kilometers with Japan's Nansei Islands. As can be seen on the map, the Taiwan range is closer to the east than to the center. So if China plans to avoid a guerrilla war in Taiwan and to engage in a short war, it's realistic to attack not only from the west, but also from the south and east, in which case Japan's southwestern islands would become a battle zone. In addition, in order to avoid a concentration of Japanese and U.S. forces in Taiwan, China may not only directly attack U.S. Kadena Air Base in Okinawa, the Air Self-Defense Forces Naha Base, and the Japan-U.S. Sasebo Base in Nagasaki, Nagasaki, but may also request that North Korea and Russia make some moves on the Korean Peninsula and in the Far East. In addition, if China holds the Bashi Channel south of Taiwan, it will allow Chinese strategic submarines equipped with SLBMs to enter the Pacific Ocean from the South China Sea, and the strategic environment between the U.S. and China would change drastically. In terms of economic security, the waters surrounding the Taiwan Strait are a vital oil sea lane for Japan. And more than 70% of the world's advanced semiconductor infrastructure factories are concentrated on the main island of Taiwan. In fact, according to a Taiwanese public opinion poll conducted in March that was just referred to, more Taiwanese people believe that Japan would rush to Taiwan's defense in the event of a Taiwan contingency than the U.S. And an increasing number of Taiwanese believe that a Taiwan contingency would also be a Japan contingency. Based on what I just mentioned, if the U.S. 7th Fleet or other forces were to pass through the Bashi Channel and act in the northern South China Sea or other areas in the event of a Taiwan contingency, and it's difficult to imagine the maritime self-defense forces not acting together, and if it does not, the Japan-U.S. alliance will effectively collapse. The same applies to the protection of U.S. forces, including de missile defense in the East China Sea. Now, data-centric security and cyber intelligence uh, capabilities have to be uh, uh, improved in order to uh, have good information about Taiwan. In the deserts of Gansu pro province, China is conducting missile fire drills in imitation of Kadima Air Base. 
and Sasebo Air Base. Uh, the U.S. had strengthen, strengthened the protection of its forces in Kadena and Sasebo as they do in Guam. Further, in order to load China in the event of a Taiwan contingency, if some moves can be made with India's cooperation, China will be forced to deal uh, not only with the Taiwan front to the east, but also with the Indian front to the south. In addition, if the uh, medium range missiles can be deployed at the Diego um, Garcia base in the Chagos Islands, China will have to build a missile defense network on its southern front on a permanent basis. This would be a huge burden on China. I believe it's time for the U.S. to rethink its uh, strategic, ambiguous uh, strategy towards uh, Taiwan, its ambiguous strategy. Take a step forward. At the very least, the mere mention of the possibility of the U.S. offering extended nuclear deterrence it provides to Japan, to Taiwan, would greatly enhance peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and push Japan to cooperate with Japan. If Japan takes further steps to defend Taiwan, this will ultimately reduce the burden on the U.S. in peacetime. It's important to create an environment in which Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea can play more roles and re responsibilities in defending East Asia. For example, South Korea is no stranger to the Taiwan contingency. Korea is almost 100 percent on the Taiwan straight for oil and sea lanes. It needs to play a role in the stability of the Taiwan Strait. Although Japan-U.S.-South Korea cooperation in the defense of Taiwan cannot be a quick fix, under the guise of protecting its own sea lanes, South Korea should first connect joint drills in the South China Sea, followed by the East China Sea, with the U.S. and South Korea as partners, and then Japan, the U.S., and South Korea. The U.S.-South Korea alliance should function not only against North Korea, but also for the stability of East Asia. In this sense, Japan-U.S. ROK cooperation should be developed from the era of cooperation with North Korea to include, in addition, sea lane defense and Taiwan Strait defense. I believe increasing the role of Japan in South Korea and East Asia and positioning the U.S. military to perform its functions in a more tactical and strategic manner will lead to stability in the Taiwan Strait and in East Asia. In U.S. Diplomacy, Southeast Asia uh, has uh, had a low priority, and this should be uh, heightened. Taiwan, how do you see the, <laughs> the strategy? One of my main goals in coming to the U.S. was to talk about Japan's NSS and how it will change. And to see to seek a commitment from the United States uh, with respect to it. We came to explain our counter-strike capability, and uh, this has been welcomed, and the U.S., uh, our U.S. counterparts have uh, expressed their uh, expectations, and they have agreed with uh, uh, what I've said. I think that uh, this was the core uh, purpose. But there's another one, and that's the China-Taiwan issue. If there were a conflict or if a conflict seemed to be about to take place, then what kind of stance would the U.S. take? There is the U.S.-Taiwan uh, Relations Act, but it's not an alliance. It's support, but it's not an alliance. Taiwan could become like Ukraine. Some people are concerned about that. So in our discussions with the U.S. government officials, we are talking about how deeply uh, the U.S. will uh, act vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. It's important uh, for, for Japan. The U.S. and Japan um, uh, must coordinate in East Asia. In the U.S.'s actions, the Japan has to take some role. If Japan is in a conflict, then will the U.S. step up? We have already seen these sorts of things happening. 
what kind of cooperation can Japan provide to uh, the U.S.? What kind of uh, support will the U.S. provide to Japan? So, as members of the Diet, and also uh, we, we, we are making this trip, and we also hear that uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishi will visit. What will the U.S. do? And what will Japan do when the time comes? These are weighty issues that must be discussed in earnest between the U.S. and Japanese governments. We wish for peaceful solutions. However, Japan must uh, create its own, uh, build up its own defensive capabilities as well. So I, I, as the American on the, on the panel, it might be useful to think about the question of American support that both representatives have raised. And you know, we have long, through the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, supplied Taiwan with the capabilities needed to defend itself. I don't expect that to change, and in fact, our Congress will ensure that that doesn't change. So I am not worried in that respect. I think we've also in the past seen the United States demonstrate by sending forces uh, to the region uh, when China has threatened Taiwan, uh, American interest in, in commitment to the defense of Taiwan. Maybe it's not a formal ally, um, but still in 1996 we did respond when, when Beijing was threatening the use of missiles during a Taiwanese election, right? So we want to be attuned not only to the operational balance, but also to the political balance that we need to, to respond to. I think, you know, I, I get a little worried when we talk simply about a cross-strait contingency, because I think for the U.S.-Japan alliance, we should be thinking that, about this in the framework of a defense of Japan contingency. In other words, if there is the use of force across the strait, Japan's own security will be threatened in ways, even if we don't know directly how. So I think there's a, there's a frame here that I don't want to narrow it just to a specific contingency, but to think of the way in which a Taiwan contingency would impact Japan's own defenses, I think is really very important for the alliance. That being said, our militaries are already thinking through, according to the Financial Times, uh, some of the, the scenarios um, that they may need to respond to should the cross-straits relationship either become a critical crisis or actually involve the kinetic use of force. And I think we need to think of both time frames. The actions up to, and Onogara-san, you referenced this, a crisis or raising tension, right, raise tensions that make us think there may actually be a use of force. Uh, and, and then what happens once it begins, once it happens. And I think there you, we have to uh, learn a little bit from the Ukrainian example here, and what I think the U.S. and Japan could benefit from discussing more, both our governments, uh, but also a little bit more in, in forums like this, is the role that nuclear coercion could play in a crisis, uh, and the way in which the, the threat of the use of nuclear weapons could then affect the way in which we would like to respond. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't respond if there's nuclear coercion, so please don't misunderstand me. But what I'm seeing, what you see in the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a very deliberate use of nuclear coercion. And that is something that we often don't talk too much about in the alliance because we don't imagine uh, the scenario that we're seeing in Ukraine. But I think it does open up some new questions about our obligation to inform the public. Uh, because the publics will also be in, engaged if we're in the middle of a crisis that is escalating like this. So it's very important, and this is why this forum for me is so important, is that we have the transparent dialogue about some of these issues, the what ifs, uh, and that these conversations are not just held among experts or within the governments themselves, that we have these a little bit um, more openly. Uh, in a very blunt way, I have little doubt the United States would respond if China initiated the use of force against Taiwan how we should respond and what Japan's role is remains to be seen, I think. And we need to think that about that through very carefully. Um, but I think um, the debate that's been going on in Washington, as you all know, is whether we should have strategic ambiguity or strategic clarity. Just to out myself, I, I reside on the side of strategic ambiguity for the moment. I don't think we should encourage a crisis. <laughs> and I think that's the political dynamic we have to think about as well. But we should quietly make absolutely sure 
that we are ready to respond should there be a crisis. Uh, and that's the kind of activities that we've been talking about here. Um, I think that the strategy already is getting a little bit of ground in Australia. Australian public now see Taiwan as an independent nation. Uh, there's been recent polling there that suggests the government should do something uh, if there is aggression against Taiwan. So I think you're starting to see public awareness. And that poll that you suggested, Mike, at the beginning in the Nikkei says, uh, says to me from this you know, distance away from Japan that the Japanese public's thinking about this is also changing. So I think this is a, this is a conversation to be had with our publics, uh, as well as obviously with our military planners and, and our political leaders as well. Sato-san laid out very well what's at stake for Japan um, uh, in, uh, in terms of Taiwan's uh, security and um, freedom from coercion. And I think Sato-san, in the U.S. Congress and in, and in the debate in the U.S., at least among experts, there's a very strong consensus uh, along the same lines. Um, and you can see American public opinion, and especially congressional opinion, rising in the same way it is in Japan and Australia. Um, I think that when people call for strategic clarity, um, the aspiration is to deter Chinese coercion and aggression and show American commitment, which is the right goal. But having worked on this in both the Pentagon and the White House, people don't always know what they mean when they say strategic clarity. What does that mean? Does it mean an Article 5 kind of security treaty commitment uh, ratified by the U.S. Senate like we have with Japan or NATO or Australia, I, uh, that, that would be extremely difficult politically right now. And then you have to consider if the U.S. pushed for something like that, would we have been able to get the G7, Korea, yeah. the EU, and other countries to show such strong support for Taiwan? Uh, I think there are other ways to show um, de facto strategic clarity rather than calling for de jure because de jure strategic clarity would be a treaty ratified by the U.S. Senate. But de facto, in reality, showing more um, clarity about the American commitment uh, is possible in many ways. And Sheila talked about the operational, uh, the U.S.-Japan security um, uh, cooperation and defense, defense, Japan's defense capabilities is another way. Um, U.S. declaratory policy. The Taiwan Relations Act states clearly that an attack on Taiwan would, would be a grave threat to our interests. There are ways that policymakers can build on that language. So there are lots, there's a very good menu to show uh, strong support for Taiwan security um, uh, and uh, to do so in the context of the Taiwan Relations Act and to build international support. Mm -hmm. So that's the discussion we need to have next. Yeah. I think the proposal from former Prime Minister Abe and others for strategic clarity throws down the kind of marker for that discussion. And then now we, I think practically we need to yep. think how do we get there um, in the way Sheila talks about. I'd like to go to the audience. So what we'll do is um, I'll call on folks and then Nick, they'll walk to the mic. So show your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And I saw Jeffrey Hornung go first. Um, and then ma'am, you can go next. And in, so Jeffrey, go to the mic. But in the meantime, I will get one of our online um, online uh, questions. I'll make sure it's not a text from my wife about groceries. Um, please pick up cabbage and instant ramen. Um, so, um, actually, interestingly, a number of questions about Russia. Um, and there are three questions on Russia which ask um, about the growing threat from Russia, not just evident in Ukraine, but in the, in the Northeast Asia region, the North Pacific, Russian operations are increasing. And also, um, what prospect there is, if any, for resolution of the Northern Territories issue? Um, and then if I can add, um, what about Sakhalin and, and gas investments? That'll be a very touchy subject going forward. Um, one of the industry leaders in Japan said they intend to go ahead with these investments. Up till now, Japan has been very much in lockstep with G7. This starts to make Japan look different. So just Russia, gas, um, deterring Russian coercion um, is a set of questions for our panelists. Uh, Onodero-san, do you, do you want to start? In our th uh, threat estimate, uh, 
earlier we had said we would monitor Russia, but now we have uh, characterized it as a threat. In the wake of the Ukraine invasion, the US, uh, Japan, uh, along with the U.S. and the G7 and uh, many other countries in the Western camp, have uh, applied sanctions. So uh, Russia is seen as an enemy, especially uh, uh, military vessels are uh, more and more active in around the northern territories. And Russia has been doing joint training with China. Last year, a uh, joint uh, Russia and China fleet uh, and, uh, uh, sailed around Japan. So in Japan, R Russia is not just the threat. It's uh, Russia and China combined. Putin and Xi Jinping uh, watched that training together. I think that this was uh, something that uh, might be difficult for uh, you to get the same impression as us, but is rather chilling. And uh, the Northern Territories issue must be discussed, but uh, not uh, that will not happen under uh, this administration. Now, uh, Crimea has uh, been occupied by Russia 77 years ago. Uh, Russia has, in like manner, illegally occupied Japanese territory. And forced labor in Siberia has been the fate of some of our uh, citizens. Uh, Japan has the experience of uh, this treatment at Russia's hands, which is why we have such sympathy for Ukraine. With respect to uh, oil and so forth, uh, in our dealings with Russia, this will become tougher. We would like to move toward uh, regional uh, energy uh, by stages. Uh, on, well, there was a massacre in Bucha, in Ukraine, and that those that unit were f uh, from Habarovsk, that, or, that the U.S. and Japan were staring down. So they went down to the south. So that's the sort of uh, unit that we have to face down. And we had to think that uh, they still had that uh, uh, DNA with them in uh, carrying out those atrocities. And they have SLBM submarines in the Sea of Okhotsk that could strike us at any moment. Between uh, Sakhalin, I don't think that there's any way. If you think about the Cold War, uh, the US did not have forces in Hokkaido. But last year, for the first time, the U.S. Army, HIMARS as a long uh, range, uh, it was fired at a range at Hokkaido. And R Russia was, uh, they reacted against this. It was the first time for a long range test to be done in Hokkaido. And so we will have to uh, increase such land-based defenses. With respect to the Northern Territories, Putin has said that uh, they won't, they would not uh, engage in negotiations, but we have uh, placed sanctions on Russia and on Putin. And the Japanese government has said that uh, they would not uh, negotiate with uh, Putin on the northern territories. 
on energy, as Honor Dear Sensei said, we'll have to gradually withdraw. But we have three main sources. LNG1, LNG2, Sahalin 1, Sahalin 2. And Shell is trying to get out of Sahalin 1. But after they get out, if China backfills, this won't do any good. And it seems that after Shell withdrawing from Sahalin 2, that uh, a Chinese firm is uh, expressing interest. It's like the. Uh, Azadegan uh, oil field in Japan. After Ch uh, Japan withdrew, China backfilled. And this would be a negative in terms of security. So we have to think about who would backfill if we were to withdraw. But as shareholders, we could um, uh, be vocal about various things. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was very involved in that. And um, the initial position in Tokyo was that if we pull out, China will go in. But that was not convincing to a lot of people in Congress. So I suspect this is an issue that will feature when President Biden goes to Tokyo. Um, and there may be some debate, which is good, because we agree on so much. <laughs> we, 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 we can afford to have debate over some issues. All right, let's turn to Jeffrey for the question. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jeffrey Hornan, uh, RAND Corporation. Uh, I have one question for each of you. So first, Onodera Sensei. Um, there's a lot of questions that can be asked about the 2% defense increase and sort of how that money will be spent. But the question I have is, you covered a lot of the more high-tech the cyber, the space, electromagnetic. But there's a lot of issues um, with Japan's passive defenses on its bases, whether that be hardening um, munitions, shelters, fuel lines, communications, and just stockpilings of, of missiles. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to, do you anticipate when you increase the defense budget, uh, will a significant portion of that be dedicated to some of these more resiliency uh, efforts on um, GTI bases? And then Sato-sensei, understanding a lot of what you said about the counter-strike capability, as you know, a few years ago, uh, then Secretary of Defense Esper went to the region after the United States pulled out of the INF Treaty looking for a host for ground-based intermediate range missiles. Um, we didn't find one. And as you know, the U.S. Army has publicly said that it's looking for a home in the Indo-Pacific for its multi-domain task force, which also contains a kinetic unit within that. Where do you see in Japan's strategy hosting U.S. kinetic capabilities? Thank you. So passive defense, cyber, and then let's take the next question since we're running out of time. So please, oh. and then we'll wrap up yeah, with your um, answers. Tina Chong with uh, Voice of America's China Branch. My question is uh, for uh, Mr. Sato about uh, uh, you had a uh, two plus two meeting with Taiwan's uh, ruling D uh, DPP last year, and I'd like to know uh, any updates following that uh, meeting uh, in terms of uh, Japan-Taiwanese exchanges. And also you advocated, you proposed uh, last year uh, about the U.S., uh, Japan, and Taiwan information sharing, the uh, trilateral information or intelligence sharing. I'd like to know the uh, feasibility and possibilities uh, of, of yeah. that kind of uh, sharing that, uh, between U.S., Japan, and Taiwan. Thank you. Great questions. We have about three or four minutes. <laughs> so, onegaishimasu. <laughs> If you read the proposal carefully, you can see that it refers to uh, endurance and uh, resilience. And it may not have been mentioned earlier, but we had long discussions about this. And we heard from people on the front lines of defense. What's necessary is to uh, improve the operational uh, uh, tempo of existing equipment. But uh, we have to 
do that, this uh, uh, for, first of all and to improve uh, our, our, our budget for uh, e equipment. Now, 2% is said that we have this in mind as the NATO goal. Coast Guard, pensions uh, are not included. Now, how will we actually set an index? This will, will be uh, something that we decide upon. What we have to do is get what's necessary. Our current budget is not enough, so it must be increased. The LDP will uh, pursue this as, a, as part of its platform. Thank you very much. Ammunition and uh, so, uh, equipment are very important you know, for, uh, I used to be in the uh, Ground South Defense Forces, so ammunition is very important. So how are we going to uh, do counter strike capability in terms of collective deterrence? We have to include the strength of the private sector as well, especially for cyber. We can't just rely on standoff missiles. Cyber, drones, uh, so these are all included in counter-strike capability. That's why we talked about counter-strike capabilities, plural. Now, it's not good for uh, the U.S. and Japan to have zero missiles in the same class uh, where China has many. And it's one of the uh, th themes that we must unavoidably consider. On Taiwan and the impossibility of government-to-government -government consultations, we can have uh, for, uh, foreign affairs and defense two plus two between the two ruling parties. Now, uh, I d did participate in such a two plus two, and we are regularly following up on this. I am the project team leader for Taiwan in the LDP, and Yamashita Sensei is the Secretary General. And on the third, uh, I'll be going to Taiwan and talk to uh, various people, including the, the premier. It's been a very rich discussion. I want to thank you. We didn't get to many topics, but the good news is, um, to, I think tomorrow, uh, Yamashita Sensei and uh, Kono Taro Sensei will be speaking at Brookings. Um, so any questions we didn't get to, you can throw at them tomorrow. And we look forward to having Kono Sensei come back to Georgetown, Hoya Saksa. Um, and uh, let me thank our colleagues at Nikkei, who organize this trip every year, and the Japan chair staff, Nixon Cheney, Hannah Fodale, Hannah Goda, and Eri Hirano, and all of you, and especially Sheila Smith um, and Sato Sensei and Ono Sensei. Welcome back to Washington. Thank you.